Good evening, uh, everyone. We, we can't see you, but we hope you can see us. And welcome to this Hyman Center event. Uh, my job tonight is somewhere between a timekeeper and referee. But before getting down to business, I want to just say a very quick word about the book and author we are going to be talking about tonight. Um, early on in Rescuing Socrates, Roosevelt Montas says that the case for liberal education is hard to make because it's not something subject to discursive description. That's a paraphrase, not a quotation. It's an experience, therefore resistant to any outline or list of attributes or functional assessment in much the same way that no plot summary can ever convey the experience of reading the novel itself. That is a quotation. In fact, it's almost impossible to convey the meaning of liberal education to anyone who hasn't experienced it, which is a problem because that covers a lot of people, including many with power and influence within universities themselves. All of which is why the only way to defend it, in my view at least, is to make it happen, uh, even for students who may be initially reluctant to give it a try. In my view, uh, this is what makes Roosevelt's book so exceptional. In the bloated literature of pro and con arguments about this or that pedagogy or curriculum or syllabus uh, purport, that purport to represent what education should be. He makes his experience in the Columbia Corps as student and teacher, and now I would say as evangelist, vivid, personal, intensely alive. And I think to many readers, irresistible. As many of you know, and the rest of you will soon learn, he speaks as well as he writes and has become an indispensable voice in the national debate over what a college education can be and who should have a chance to experience it. He's one of the reasons I feel stubbornly optimistic even on dark days. With that, let me welcome our panelists and thank them all in advance for their time and you in the audience for yours. Uh, David Denby, distinguished critic and author of an earlier book about the virtues of the core. Danel Padilla Peralta, professor of classics at Princeton, to whom I owe personal thanks for his devotion over many years to the high school teaching that he, like Roosevelt, has made a part of his professional life and Turku Eshiksel, I hope I got that pronunciation close at least, Deputy Chair of Columbia's Political Science Department, who works on what might be called transnational constitutionalism, surely an urgent subject in today's fractured world. Roosevelt will speak first, uh, then each panelist for approximately eight minutes, then Roosevelt will have a chance to respond, and if I can figure out how to use the Q&A function, we should have a few minutes for questions from the audience uh, when, this, when this wraps up. And so please send those questions in through the Q&A function. Thank you all for coming tonight. We appreciate it. And I will turn it over to Roosevelt now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andy. And um, thank you for, your, for the generosity and kindness of your assessment of the book. Um, it's not the first time that I am uh, moved by your kindness and your generosity. Um, and I want to thank the, the panelists um, who I think I, ca I can call all of them friends and let not that bias your um, reception of their, uh, their remarks. But um, David, Danelle, Turco have, have all been um, uh, important friends in, for me and, and supporters and, and key important um, interlocutors in, in my thinking um, and writing about, about uh, these issues. Um, I, I guess in eight minutes, I will try to say a little bit about, um, give a sense for maybe people who haven't looked at the book of what, what this book is about, um, what it does. People who have reviewed the book have found um, have found the book hard to summarize. And if you had to say one thing about it, I, I, it'll probably be that the book is fundamentally a defense of liberal education. 
Um, and I think it's in explaining how the book does that, that things get a little tricky. One way to think about the book is, is, is as composed of three strands. And one of those strands is autobiographical. That part of the book reads like a memoir where I meditate on how my life has unfolded and the role that liberal education has played in it, in making me the person that I am, that is how liberal education has played out in this particular life. The second strand of the book consists of a discussion of four authors that have had a big impact on me. Um, it's an exposition, a general exposition of their ideas, an argument about why they matter, how these writers explore ideas and questions that can illuminate the life of any individual. That is how, how these, these writers raise and clarify human dilemmas that every person faces and that every person has to resolve in his or her own life. The authors I, I discussed are, are St. Augustine, Plato with a, a little bit of Aristotle, Sigmund Freud and Mahatma Gandhi. Then there is a third strand of the book, and that is uh, a polemical strand. It's a look at the shape and character of American higher education and the place of liberal education in it. I make the basic argument that the modern American higher education environment is essentially hostile to the practice of liberal education. The kind of liberal education, the practice of liberal education that transformed my own life and which I argue throughout the book has the power to transform the lives of young people today. A kind of education that is especially relevant and important to young people like me who, who came from, who come from low income households, who are the first in their families to attend college, uh, broadly what we called marginalized communities. Um, and maybe I'll say just a, a quick word about elaborating on each of those strands. Uh, first, this, this autobiographical strand, as, as some of you will know, I spent many years, uh, 10, I, I counted them, um, as uh, administrator of the Center for the Core Curriculum. And um, in that, from that position, I, I, I advocated, uh, that's where I became an evangelist for liberal education. I saw my position at, at Columbia as an opportunity to advance, advocate for this kind of education. And one thing that I uh, was always reluctant to do from, f during that period was to talk about my own life, uh, talk about my own uh, trajectory. And part of that reluctance comes from my distaste for the stereotypes associated with the immigrant story, with the rise of someone from poverty and marginality through education. And it's not that these things are, aren't true about me, but that, that I have been averse to turning those aspects of my life into an identity. The fear of being held up as a model, as an example, you know, that stuff makes me want to throw up. Um, and, and I have been tempted to screw up just to avoid that horrible fate. Um, but in writing this book, uh, something kind of got unstuck in me. And, and, and it became clear that if I was going to make a full throttle entire case for the meaning of liberal education, I was going to have to look inside myself and talk about the ways in which this education helped me orient myself in the world, helped me figure out um, my way, um, how my complicated life story um, was clarified was it how how my education helped me put together a whole sense of myself from lots of different parts and and as, as those of you who have or who will look at the book um i you know was born in the dominican republic and in a rural mountain village in the dominican republic and came to new york um just before my 12th birthday two days before my 12th birthday not speaking english um, with my mother who had been here a few years and my older brother, we were in some ways a typical um, Dominican immigrant family, um, poor, 
uh, with with few resources um, and uh, had a very, very hard time. I went to public schools, found myself at Columbia as a freshman. And that's kind of where the story begins of um, my encounter with formal liberal education and, and what it meant for me to be reading St. Augustine, to be reading Plato, to be reading Aristotle, and to and, and trying and, and being in a in a literature humanities classroom in this in this first year intense seminar where we're looking at these books, we are grappling with those questions. I'm listening to my peers, I'm listening to my professors, I'm reading the books, the ways in which all that came together to help me make sense of my life and um, my trajectory through college, into graduate school, and as a faculty member, how um, how my life has in, has been altered and shaped by ongoing conversations with these books, ongoing conversations with people around these books. Um, a word about the, my choice of, of authors. Um, in some sense, it is idiosyncratic. In some sense, these are writers who happen to have had an outside impact on my life at the moment that I encounter them. Uh, but there is something about them that probably helped that, which is that they're all concerned and devoted to self-exploration. All of them have a drive towards examination of the self. They all are models of how to fulfill Socrates' injunction, injunction about living an examined life, right? Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. These are all authors who exemplify and model the examined life. Um, one other thing about my choice of authors is that in treating them, I model non-expertise. Uh, my training is in, in, is in pre-Civil War American intellectual history and literature. Uh, none of these authors are, 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 are figures that I have engaged in a scholarly, professional way. I, I teach them, and in that way, it's, it's, it's professional, but I, I don't have access to the languages in which they wrote. Um, I'm not immersed in the secondary literature or in the scholarly, scholarly debates around them. Uh, I read them and I teach them as works that speak to our fundamental humanity. Um, so part of what my treatment of those authors do is to model the kind of non-expert non -expert general treatment under which these authors can be meaningful and transformative for a non-scholar of them. And lastly, a word about the polemical aspect of, um, of the book. I, I argue that the structure of the contemporary university organized around departmental pigeonholes, which correspond roughly to academic disciplines, um, have choked the possibility of liberal education. Um, that is the dominance of disciplinary specialization has squeezed liberal education out of the curriculum. And today there is very little distinction between the specialized pursuit of the liberal arts, the kind of thing you might do in graduate school if you study in the liberal arts, you know, literature, or classics, or philosophy, or even in the major, which is a specialized approach to the study of the traditional liberal arts. That, that has been conflated with actual general education, the kind of education that is appropriate to any individual, uh, not just to somebody who wants to study as a scholar the liberal arts. Um, I also um, point to the, the dominance of the research ideal in the university. That is the ideal that approaches the task of the university as the discovery, codification, dissemination of new knowledge. That powerful dominant idea in the university, which has produced the extraordinary kind of breathtaking advances in, in, in science and, and other areas of knowledge that have Given, given us the, the modernity. That ideal when transposed to the humanities, to the examination, exploration of questions that are vitally central, vitally important to the humanity and the cultivation of every individual. When that research ideal is transposed to that area, um, you end up with, um, it doesn't doesn't work. Uh, those the, the kind of exploration that those areas dwell on are not the kinds of questions they dwell on are not susceptible to the investigation, accumulation, dissemination of knowledge that organizes the rest of the research university. We don't know better today the nature of justice. 
just because we have had 2,000 years, 2,500 years since Plato wrote the Republic. We don't understand today the, the, the nature of political power, where to draw the line between individual responsibility and individual liberty and collective responsibility. These things are not susceptible to simple accumulation of knowledge. Uh, so the research ideal has been so dominant in the university as to uh, force a kind of specialization within the humanities discipline that has been crippling to the project of general education. And lastly, I address the, the kind of epistemological developments within the humanities themselves that have challenged the very values and views of human nature that undergird a project of liberal education. And um, you know, I can unpack some of that in our discussion, but I see I have already uh, far exceeded my eight minutes and I apologize. Thanks, Roosevelt. And I have no idea what, I think I introduced you in the order in which the boxes appear on my screen. So maybe we'll stick with that order and we'll go with David, Danell, and Turku. Shall we do that, David? Uh, thank you, Andy. I um, want to apologize for squinting at the audience because this eye isn't very good. So when I look at my notes, I have to squint, close it in order to, uh, to read them. As I was reading Roosevelt's book, I thought, what kind of novel? is this. Now, that may seem like a strange question, but I've been cued in to read autobiographies by Norman Mailer's review of, magnificent review of uh, Norman Podhoritz's book, Making It 55 Years Ago. And I thought that it, uh, if you think of Roosevelt's book as a novel uh, or as having the shape of a fable or of a fiction, that it's both a Bildungsroman, a book about learning literally, um, and a novel about the young man from the provinces uh, who comes to the capital. Now, I don't want to press you, Roosevelt, in, this, in some cliched uh, exemplar, exemplum, um, but I, it is, uh, I'm speaking now of the literary product, that you, not, not of how your life might be used by other people, but by the, the nature of your text. And it is certainly, you know, has some familiar resemblances to the red and the black, great expectations. And our local Jewish versions, um, Pat Horowitz, I mentioned, Alfred Kazin, Irving Howe, uh, and so on, poor boys from the outer boroughs who come to City College or Columbia and attain uh, a certain distinction. Uh, uh, they come searching for knowledge, for romantic uh, adventure, intellectual and spiritual, cultural capital, as we now say. Um, Roosevelt's book and mine are complementary. Uh, Andy mentioned the great books, which came out 25 years ago. Um, he's, he's acquiring, not in the monetary sense, but in intellectual and spiritual sense. I was trying to recover. I was 48, I had a good job. I was film critic at New York Magazine, married two kids, Upper West Side bourgeois person. And I felt I had lost myself and I needed to take the core curriculum again. And the project was naive in many ways, as certain people told me, uh, but it, it explicitly, because I was unaware or indifferent to the critical and theoretical work of the previous 20 years, this was 1991, when I wrote, uh, telling me that any notion of an inviolate self or uh, a recovered self or so on was more or less a myth. Um, and thank God that I, uh, didn't know much about all of that because I might never have written uh, if I had. Uh, second, it was naive because the notion of, of the danger of losing yourself in media images in 1991 uh, seems childish compared to where we are now uh, with the internet uh, and 24 hour cable news and whether the immersion that many of us undergo is uh, creates a self or destroys a self would be an interesting subject for a book, I think. Roosevelt ignores theory, but, but for a quick uh, rebuttal or dismissal himself. Uh, and he certainly speaks as if he had a self worth uh, discovering. Although I, I, I wouldn't use the word inviolate. Uh, in fact, he's highly violatable intellectually, if that's the right word. In other words, he's constantly changing and renewing and reshaping, which of course is the message of the core curriculum. The books are chosen in such a way such that they uh, speak to each other uh, backwards and forwards or even in contestation, to use an academic word, and with the hope that you develop um, a, a, a contested relationship with them 
um, and, and with yourself. Uh, in other words, the message, if there is a message, is uh, you, you read for life, uh, that you develop a private reading life. I have a lot of friends, all of us are in our 70s, and we all have a book going no matter where else, uh, what else we're doing. I don't know if young educated people think that way um, about a, a private reading life in quite the same way. I, I don't know if it's there or it's, it's not there. Now, I want to get contestational, uh, but not with Roosevelt. Um, I want to dispute an attack on this book and Professor Weinstein's book that appeared in the New Yorker by Louis Menand uh, three, four weeks ago. Um, and he, he says there have been other books lamenting the threats uh, to our humanities in the past. Many, every, it's the kind of book that's written in every generation. And my response to that was, so what? There may be five books about uh, American inequality in the next two years. The fifth book may be the best one. It may not be the best one. The fact that there have been earlier books regarding the same subject is, is irrelevant. Second, and here's the heart of the matter, um, he writes that in great books courses, and he's talking about Lidham, which he taught, and which he has created a version of at Harvard. Uh, quote, discussion is led by an instructor, but the instructor's job is not to give the students a more informed understanding of the text or to train them in methods of interpretation, which is what would happen in a typical literature or philosophy department course. The instructor's job is to help the students relate the text to their own lives. What in the world is he talking about? Uh, now, it, it's uh, halfway accurate as a, a description of Roosevelt's book, but he's talking here about the classroom. Uh, he's not talking about Roosevelt's book and that's, he's talking about the classroom. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've taken Lit Hum four times. I've taken CC twice. I took it in 1961 as a freshman, twice in 1991 for my book report. And I took it two years ago, again, in Nicholas Dames's Lit Hum section. And let me tell you <laughs> that Nic Professor Nicholas Dames of the English department does not engage in touchy-feely conversations with his students in the course of Lit Hum. It is as sternly uh, attended to the texts and how to read them and how to contextualize them as one could possibly imagine. And now I, I do admit that uh, Professor Edward Taylor died a few years ago, great Columbia teacher um, and great Lit Hum teacher did say on his opening class day, you're here for very selfish reasons. You're here to make a self. What did he mean by that? He meant that they were about to hurl themselves against some of the older works of art, uh, like the Iliad with its notable absence of pity and, and the Odyssey in which Telemachus, um, a very young man, decides to kill all the servant girls who've been sleeping with the suitors. Uh, in other words, they would find things, some things in them uh, that were reaffirming and some things that were rebarbative of their nature as, as modern American and foreign middle class and upper middle class students. And that there would be a kind of reformulation of self and a shedding of self. Well, that's not exactly touchy feely, uh, pathetic uh, ki kind of class uh, activity either. And Taylor never brought it up again. Um, in, in other words, the whole rest of his course was devoted precisely to how do you read these texts? Uh, what is the context in which they appear and so on? Exactly what Luke says, they are not. That's a slander, what he wrote. It's absolutely wrong. Now, uh, it's particularly odd because, um, as I said, Louis Menand is um, uh, the creator, along with Professor Allison Simmons and Stephen Greenblatt and other distinguished people at Harvard, of their version of lit literature humanities. Um, it, it's different from Columbia's, uh, but it's a very good course and a very popular course, an elective of course, like Yale's general studies um, uh, and of uh, course, and it's not called general studies, but you know what I mean. Um, and University of Chicago, by the way, has given up requiring something like Lit Hum and CC for all its students. You can take it. Columbia remains um, among the major uni research universities as, uh, as, as Roosevelt just said, devoted to this. Uh, but the oddity of Menand's article was that he seemed to be uh, shucking off some accusation of intellectual second rateness, um, as this has nothing to do with me, whereas in, in fact it does. It was a bit incoherent intellectually. Fortunately, Roosevelt shucks off nothing 
um, and engages directly uh, with the purpose of the course and the purpose of his uh, of his life as it reformulated through the course. And uh, uh, another activity which seems to me just as important uh, as his teaching is his continued activity in talking to high school students in New York and trying to convince them what he calls the third strand of his book, the polemical strand, uh, that they uh, should consider courses in the humanities and not get trapped into narrowly identitarian notions of what their higher education should be. Uh, you can't help noticing that of his four authors he talks about, one is a pagan, I guess we would say, one a Christian, one a Jew, and one a Hindu. It's a big world. Open yourself up to it. Thank you, Roosevelt. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Danell. Hi, folks. Uh, I open with thanks to the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities for convening us all to talk about Roosevelt's book. I count it among one of the great pleasures of my continuing association with Columbia to have worked and to continue to work alongside Roosevelt. And among one of the purest pleasures of this pandemic time um, to embrace the challenge of this book. One feature of the book's early reception has intrigued me. Uh, no truer, because more predictable, um, constant of white supremacy in the academy is the tendency to pit black and brown scholars against each other. And in the hands of a chattering section of the commentariat, this tendency takes the form of question begging broadsides against identity politics that scale up from small or even not so small differences between black and brown scholars to a general claim about the invalidity of race conscious and race centered thinking as a principle of rigorous analysis. If the black and brown scholars don't all agree, runs the thought, surely this must mean that an essential precept of identity politics, that those with a presumptively common racial identity will find common political cause is void. And from here, it's but a short skip to the argument that identity politics is, is bankrupt. Forget the poetry of the Combahee River Collective statement's espousal of identity politics, still reverberating decades later. And I quote from the statement, we believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression, end quote. For critics of identity politics, the whole business uh, is a grift. And those things that really hold value, uh, normally taken in their view to be those consummate expressions of artistic excellence that enveloped in the aura of tradition are identified with or assimilated to the paradigm of the classic ought to be protected from the incursions and deformations of identity politics at all costs. To score points, these critics will also regularly traffic in various forms of false equivalency and misleading association. So great books will sometimes be taken as coextensive with the humanities as a whole or with liberal education or with a field, the specific fields such as classics. I disagree with these critics and I see their assorted rhetorical sleights of hand as the greatest grift but today's gathering is not an occasion for my crankiness. Instead, it is an occasion for joy, and it is with untainted joy that I am here to discuss Roosevelt's book in community with you, not only because rescuing Socrates is a stupendous and good read, but also because it is a book uniquely suited to the task of demonstrating that identity and positionality vitally matter to the present and future of the humanities. Who else but Roosevelt could have written this book? Its excellence resides in the singularity of the humanistic experience that animates its pages, an experience that's lived in generative tension with those historical and structural forces that embed themselves in every act of reading. In studying it for today's event, I was reminded of my favorite passage from Aimé Césaire's 1956 letter of resignation from the French Communist Party, and I quote Césaire. I'm not burying myself in a narrow particularism, but neither do I want to lose myself in an emaciated universalism. There are two ways to lose oneself, walled segregation in the particular or dilution in the universal. My conception of the universal is that of a universal enriched by all that is particular, a universal enriched by every particular, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars." End quote. That last clause, which holds me forever in its grip, has a particular charge when brought to bear uh, on the reading of Roosevelt's book. As I see it, the productive friction of the book is between the particularism of the individual humanistic encounter and the drive to generalizing and universalizing scope. It's all there in the subtitle, uh, one of those species of paratext to which I always play, pay close attention. How the great books changed my life, the particularizing, and why they matter for a new generation, the generalizing. 
We could encode the book swing between two poles in more genre specific terms as an oscillation from memoir to pro treptic, for example. The most important thing, though, is to recognize the rub of particularism and universalism as a source of this book's strength. If, in the end, I'm not persuaded always by the protreptic turn to prescription or finding wanting, find it wanting in terms of detail, it's largely because I find I place far greater weight on the particular and find myself more seduced by the particular and on the deepening and coexistence of all particulars that the book holds for. For me, the particular brandishes its full arsenal of weapons in moments such as Roosevelt's reminiscence of Dulce's gift. This is uh, from page 31, and I'll quote. It was only a few years ago that the memory of Dulce knocking on my door that night came back to me, setting off a flood of tears. How could I have forgotten that profound gesture? Why had I forgotten? And why was I remembering it just then? It was not the first time nor the last that some random trigger without a reason I can discern exposes me to a high voltage memory. A memory that was invisible before, but which has all along been exerting a subterranean force, like the massive objects beneath the surface of the moon that astronomers detected because of the gravitational distortions they produced. Each of these memories is a kind of riddle, a cryptic message from below decks, an oracle that speaks the truth I have not wanted to know, but which has now managed to break through to the surface. This is just fine. It's fine because it's melodiously crafted. It's also fine because it's densely, richly elusive. And it's proleptically elusive. The chapter from which I've quoted is focused mainly on Augustine and the passages questions of trace elements of the ferocity of Augustinian self-interrogation. But with memories, havoc raising and the return of the repressed, we're also entering the territory of another of Roosevelt's great enthusiasms, the focus of chapter three, Freud. But it's moments such as these that for this reader call into question the merits of defending great books or liberal education or the humanities as tools for self-actualization and self-expression. I want to concentrate on tools. I count 17 appearances of this noun in rescuing Socrates, often in the vicinity of justifications for the value of humanistic practice. I worry about the language of the tool uh, and toolsiness, not necessarily because I'm averse to the instrumentalization of the humanities, but I am very happy to see the humanities instrumentalized, but because I think there's more there than meets the eye. Without indulging any Aristotelian pedagogy about the purposefulness of specific tools, I, I want simply to note from my vantage point as a historian of slavery that the language of human tools and instrumentalization is a cornerstone of what some scholars have taken to term dualology or, and here I have in mind the work of Columbia's Joe Howley, the spotics. So think of the Roman enslaver and man of letters Marcus Terentius Varro's famous designation of the enslaved as a speaking tool, as an instrumental collar which we write, we write Aristotle's characterization of the enslaved as a living tool, an emshuhan, organon. The real kick on encountering the language of tools, as wielded by a Dominican-American humanist to describe his vision for liberal education, comes to the recognition that the descendants of those formerly classified as living tools are now in a position to set the terms of instrumentalization for the epistemic practices that have been implicated in that classification. We can take it one step further. It may very well be the case that the most rousing and possibly even best case for liberal education as tool cannot in the end be decoupled from the specifics of Roosevelt's identity. Or to put it another way, liberal education a la montas won't have a future separate from the Dominican American immigrants and other members of minoritized groups who decide whether or not to bend it to their purposes and ends. It was not my identity, Roosevelt writes on page 112, as a Dominican immigrant, Socrates affirmed, but something more fundamental, unquote. And yet the particular power of this defense of humanistic learning is that the contingent encounter with liberal education in its Morningside Heights incarnation comes most vibrantly to life in the crucible identity at the hands of someone who turns that education into a tool. On this last point, I can't help but keep coming back to Roosevelt's laser focus on Augustine Confessions 1-7, uh, Augustine's rumination about infant language acquisition. The line, uh, uh, the sentence that uh, Roosevelt zeroes in on uh, is this, by groans and various movements of parts of my body, I would endeavor to express the intentions of my heart to persuade people to bow to my will. Especially for those of us who came to language in the diaspora, how does the acquisition of language interact with the drive to master in circumstances and settings that seemed at first impossible to master or even worse, that strove to master us? I've been chewing on this question ever since reading Roosevelt's book. But I'm not sure that reinscribing mastery, even in the, for, to the end of self-actualization, as the proper and decisive end of liberal education is the path to individual or collective freedom. 
perhaps the more worthwhile because ultimately more genuinely emancipatory objective is to move against Augustine and join Julieta Singh, an astute reader of Gandhi, another beacon for Roosevelt, in unthinking mastery. This work of unthinking mastery requires exacting attention to the constellations of identity that we inhabit, and without consideration of which our practices of reading are hopelessly impoverished. Thanks to Roosevelt and thanks to all of you. Thank you, Danelle. Turku. Well, first of all, I want to um, thank the Heyman Center for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be on this distinguished panel. Um, I, I think I can say to each of you that reading your books has made me a better teacher. When Roosevelt announced the imminent publication of his book, I was delighted for more than the usual reasons uh, having to do with celebrating the accomplishment of a treasured colleague. Um, as I explained to him uh, at the time, I felt that I needed this book. Uh, my students needed this book. The world, or our shared world anyway, um, needed this book. So in, in my comment, I'm going to reflect on that need. So um, as the previous commentators have stated, the book makes a compelling, deeply personal, but also informative um, case for the value and indeed necessity of a liberal education. But when I say I needed this book, I have to admit that I came at it with a selfish need to answer a very particular question. Um, and I'm gonna quote from the book, uh, page 213. Uh, my question is whether, and here the quote begins, there is a compelling case for keeping the Western tradition at the center of general education, at least in the West, end of quote. So that's an affirmative sentence by uh, Roosevelt that I'm turning into a question, especially at a time when our universities are enriched by the presence of a more diverse group of students than ever, and when they profess ambitions to become global universities. So my question is, why read these books? The emphasis on these. Um, I guess I was a little surprised that the question was not central to this book, or at least it was answered mostly implicitly. Roosevelt comes out of it from, a, um, from a, maybe an oblique angle. And I, and I want to use my time to invite him to respond to it more explicitly or failing that to nudge him into writing another book, the next book. Um, so let's face it, we in the Columbia Corps and my own corner of it, contemporary civilization, which I've been teaching for some years, we have a syllabus that can't be decolonized. Um, if Aristotle, Locke, and Mill are irredeemably complicit in the making of today's injustices, and I think it's pretty undeniable that they are, and if continuing to teach their books as part of a mandatory curriculum while relegating quote-unquote non-Western masterpieces to elective components of the curriculum perpetuates oppression, perpetuates the notion that this is the pinnacle of human achievement, then there's really not much left to say in favor of a program like the core curriculum at Columbia as it's currently framed. My students say that being required to read books that don't reflect their experience, the experience of people like them, is a way of extending the grip of the cold dead hand of the past into the future. And that's the indictment that weighs most heavily on my shoulders whenever I sign up to teach a year of CC. As one of my students from last year, Will Osager, put it in a very thoughtful discussion post, quote, the enduring questions this class aims to tackle are culturally agnostic, and so it's not self-evident why Western literature is the right lens to approach these questions, end of quote. And Will added that although there's nothing inherently Western about many of the ideas that we encounter, the curatorial choices implied the most important answers to these questions. The books worth requiring originated in the West. I invite you to argue with Will's logic. I tried for about a year and I only managed to make a dignified exit because the semester ended. But if anyone wants to watch me die on this hill, I would say the following. Um, the more I think about this, it seems the more it seems to me that the problem maybe has less to do with having a required core course that centers on the quote unquote Western tradition. And in fact, a large part of our curriculum is understanding the development of an idea of the West and problematizing the notion of the West, of civilization, et cetera. And has to do more with what we mean when we say, teach these texts to our undergraduates. Because of course the court classroom is not a group of pious people studying a sacred text where we try to wrap our limited mortal faculties around the divine truth that has been revealed to us. If you've ever, if you've never been in a court classroom, I assure you there is no reverence, 
no piety and nothing is secret. Uh, we never pretend that the epistemic status of these texts is comparable to an organic chemistry textbook or an electronic circuitry textbook. The books themselves, of course, sometimes do claim authority of this sort, uh, see under Hobbes. Um, and frankly, if you're not claiming to be conveying a truth, why write a book? Um, but that sort of claim to authority is catnip for our students. It's a provocation to prove the author wrong. The text is a great but rather sluggish horse and students are a swarm of gadflies, um, to paraphrase Socrates. Um, now, there's one line of Roosevelt's book that really um, I, I grappled with and thought about for many days um, and I finally decided I disagree with it. Um, and I know it's unfair to give that one line uh, so much airtime at the expense of everything I found illuminating in the book, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway. It's like the exact opposite of the advice I give my students. Roosevelt writes, in what way are they right is almost always a more productive and a more difficult question than in what way are they wrong, end of quote. Now, I think Roosevelt might be right that in what way are they right is a more difficult question to answer, but I doubt it's more productive, at least for pedagogical purposes. So when students arrive demoralized and aggrieved because the core does not speak to their experience, does not reflect their heritage, and worse, that it reflects their experience and heritage to irrelevance, I welcome them back into the smoke-filled back room of my pedagogy, and I ask them, whether they wouldn't like to discover the origins of these errors, these injustices, to pinpoint where it all went wrong for themselves. We don't start with the presumption that we are about what we are about to receive as knowledge. And anyone who starts with that presumption quickly becomes disappointed in week two, to be precise, when they encounter Plato saying, justice is doing one's own work and not meddling with what isn't one's own. Um, there goes liberal education. Um, Rather, I tell my students, we can start from the presumption that this is a catalog of errors. And the problem is that generations of people have foolishly taken it for knowledge. Now, I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear that I don't necessarily hold this simplistic, uh, this simplistic view of the whole thing. I say this because I want to give my students the freedom to be aggrieved and skeptical and demoralized. Um, all I want is for them not to be dismissive. So if I can get past the objection that Socrates was just another privileged white male, we would find in Socrates the inspiration for speaking truth to power, to find the oppressive conventions of your society. If you pay attention, he's going to train you to be a radical and a subversive. And of course, academics are very practiced at reading texts against the grain in this way, but students often are not because they come um, uh, to us. Uh, from a, a K through 12 model of teaching where teachers and textbooks are the source of truth and that they're supposed to imbibe and recite. Um, but once we abandon this model, I think, we do take some of the sting out of the dead white males critique, or at least I console myself in that way, that once students discover that they can turn a text in like the CIA sense of the word, uh, wrest it away from its traditional associations and make it their ally, that's a powerful thing. Um, to be frank, the idea that I was entitled to see my personal experience um, reflected in the books that I was being assigned to read in my education is an idea that um, didn't occur to me at any point in my education. Um, if you grew up as I did in the quote unquote East, it's hard to break out of the sense that your whole life's purpose is trying to catch up to the quote unquote the West. And things like questioning the ethnocentrism of our notions of human excellence, et cetera, came much later for me. So this is one of the most important things I learned from my students is that reading these books because they have shaped Western civilization it, it is sort of a, a, a crappy uh, reason for reading them. Instead, the part of Roosevelt's book that really resonated with me, and this is really my last point, um, and one of the reasons why I cannot recommend it quite highly enough is his insight that reading these books as part of an intellectual and ethical pursuit is to take ownership of them. Um, I deeply identified with Roosevelt's non-sarcastic, non-defensive, non-ironic engagement with these books. I like to think that um, in my own earnest effort to understand and teach them, um, I, I have made these books my own. Uh, well, some of them, I mean, I, I certainly never took to Aquinas or Freud, sorry, Roosevelt, or, you know, to Descartes. Um, so for someone to tell me that the core doesn't reflect my experience as a Middle Eastern woman implies 
that I'm ensnared in a sort of false consciousness when I claim ownership of Plato, to think of Plato as part of my intellectual identity. Um, I don't have a problem with being under the sway of false consciousness, like who isn't? Uh, my problem is with the fact that this overlaps so neatly with the white supremacist position that the West has rightful claim to these books and nobody else does. Why do the white supremacists work for them by renouncing my claim to this tradition? And, and more importantly, I think the idea of assigning a heritage to ideas um, um, sort of misunderstands the nature of ideas. And here I take my cue from Kwame Anthony Apia, who wrote in a 2016 essay for The Guardian um, that I assigned to my students. Ideas are not like family heirlooms, not like land, not like property, certainly not like DNA. They're mine if I find them meaningful and I use them to shape my values, my life choices, my relationships, so not mine if I don't. But they're also mine in another way because they shape my values, life choices, and relationships in ways that I didn't choose because they helped to make the world that I live in in all of its terrifying cruelty and injustice and its splendor and its contradictions. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I risk the observation that this has been terrific because it feels like a very high level core class. Um, uh, Roosevelt, it'll be um, uh, your opportunity to respond to these very interesting comments from all three. Thank you. I am um, just overwhelmed um, by the richness and insight of these various responses. Um, and I echo, echo what you said, Andy, that, that this reflects the best um the best version of a of a core class um some very quick quick responses because i we we want we have to we have set aside time for for some questions from the audience um david thank you for your um uh, defense of the book before menan's um attack and uh, i think smear of of the book um menand does get at something quite fundamental um that we disagree about um i think uh there is a view of undergraduate liberal education as engaged in the in knowledge production primarily uh he, he menand uses the phrases being in the in the in the knowledge business uh, and there's another view of, looks at undergraduate liberal education which is my view it's in the business of human cultivation where knowledge, um, skills, history um, is used um, in the context of cultivation, in the context of equipping an individual to, um, to engage in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain kind of reflective life, in a certain kind of um, posture to the world towards fundamental uh, problems and, and issues in society. Um, and that is the task of general undergraduate general education. At the graduate level, at the specialized level, we are engaged in this broader uh, kind of in knowledge industry, but that is not, and we disagree very fundamentally in that, that is not the, uh, at the center of the undergraduate liberal education experience is the student as a developing unfolding individual rather than a discipline or a body of knowledge to be advanced. Um, and that's a real that's a real difference there that um, that we have. Um, Danelle, I, I I love your analysis um, and your really kind of virtuoso um, exposition of this the, how the issues of particularity, of identity, of the of, of the subjective, specific identity that I bring in is the crucible in which these ideas come to life. Um, the articulation of the particular and the, um, and the universal. And I think your, your principled rejection of the attempted co-option of my argument into a kind of culture war uh, uh, against either identity politics or a certain challenge that, uh, to the, that today's uh, scholars like you, Danielle, are mounting to the traditional paradigms that have dominated especially the humanities and especially your own discipline of the classics. 
um, it, it has been a, just such an interesting experience to see the reactions to my book, how so many of the reviewers and the commentators, um, it's as if they're not actually reading my book. They, are, they have their own idea, their own agenda, their own uh, you know, chip on their, on their shoulder that they want to hack away at. Um, and one of the things that, that um, people have been drawn to is to um, pit my, uh, my view in my book against um, your, Danelle's um, critical take um, and um, um, critique of the, of the discipline of classics and of the institutional, the forms in which the discipline of classics has been an institutional embodiment of, of white supremacism and exclusion. Um, Turco, so many questions that you raise are, are so important and alive for me. Um, I'll, I'll say this, um, if we were building a core curriculum today, I don't see a justification for making it a Western curriculum. Um, and it is a, a failure, a limitation of the Columbia curriculum that it remains exclusively Western. And the college has done various attempts at patching that. You know, the current iteration is the global core requirement in which students take two semesters of, of uh, in courses that deal with material that's broadly speaking non-Western and that's primary and that's, that, that's kind of has a, 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 at least a gesture towards multidisciplinarity. Um, and discussion, um, it's an inadequate, it's an inadequate patch to the curriculum, um, and the tradition that we tend to call West, Western tradition matters not because it is Western, but it matters because of the way that it illuminates human questions. Uh, it matters because of the way that it illu illuminates. you know, gender equality, justice, the rule of law, the nature of liberty. Um, these are not questions that are uniquely Western. Um, they have been debated in that tradition. And I think to, to encounter them and to examine them, you need to engage those texts as well. But, they, but, but, but those texts do not, do not corner that market. Um, what aspects of my identity do I find affirmed in Plato? Many, and that was the great revelation for me, that I found myself affirmed um, by and connected to Socrates when I, when I read it. Um, what aspects of my identity are not affirmed or, or do not connect with me uh, from Plato? A lot, many of them. Um, and, and, you know, I think of, I'm thinking, you know, what, uh, an author that, whose identity and whose, whose, whose kind of subject is very close to my own lived experience and to Danelle's lived experience, um, uh, Juno Diaz. Uh, what aspects of my identity does Juno Diaz affirm and does not? Well, some aspects of my identity that he affirms uh, in, his, in his writing are, are aspects of my identity that I, des that, that I despise. You know, a certain kind of masculinity, a certain kind of um, uh, cultural um, chauvinism. Um, a certain kind of racism that uh, comes down with my Dominican culture. Uh, those are not aspects of my identity that I want to celebrate. Uh, of course, then there are many other aspects of, of that, 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 that are illuminated by, by um, the force and the, the brilliance of um, a writer like Juno Diaz. Um, in what way are they right? Um, it seems to me, to, to, we, we do disagree. I think that it is a more productive way of a uh, more productive set of questions to ask about, about this, these writers. One other, one, one other aspect to that is um, to read texts from the past, to read ancient texts, to read, to do a kind of historical, chronological survey to, you know, whatever breath, you know, you could, you, you, however extensive that survey is, is to engage in a genealogy of present injustice, present oppression, present exploitation.
It is also to engage in a genealogy of the values that make present oppression, injustice, exploitation unacceptable. It is also to engage in a history of, in a genealogy of the values in the name of which we uh, challenge those uh, oppressive structures. Um, so it cuts both ways. And I think that the, the value in, educa in, in their, their educative value uh, has to encompass both. Um, okay, I think I'll stop there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all. And um, let me say a couple, a couple of things and try not to take up too much time. Uh, the panelists have generally, generously agreed that, that they're willing to stay until 7.30. So I'm gonna make a game time referee call that we can have a sort of 15 minute overtime period here. Cause I think a lot of good questions have been raised and there are some very good questions in the Q and A that, that I've been trying to keep track of. So let me with your indulgence um, say one thing and then try to group the questions that have come in in a, in a couple of different categories and then open it up back to you for your responses. Um, I would I would just make the following observation and, and this is coming some, some of you, no reason for you to know this, that I have one foot in, in Colombia these days and another foot uh, I'm responsible for the direction of a, of a small foundation that's trying to do what it can to sustain and uh, enlarge liberal education uh, at other institutions around the country. And looking, uh, listening to this conversation from that second perspective, I just want to observe that we, all of us participating in this, have the luxury of sort of, you know, debating what exactly should be the content of the of CC or, or Lit Hum. David observes that Columbia has remained true and steady where other institutions have perhaps lost their way. I think, David, you may overestimate a little bit the, the long-term stability of the core at Columbia, which is always facing uh, pressures and, and stresses as well it should be for some of the reasons that Turku evinced. But my larger point is that if you look beyond a very small uh, group of institutions such as Columbia, you will find very few examples in any kind of institution, elite uh, or open access or everything in between, very few examples of a compulsory course with, with Western authors or global authors or some combination of the two taught in relatively small sections by full-time faculty in which a large number, if not all undergraduate students read some or most of the same books. Those are some of the el elemental qualities of the Columbia Corps quite before we get to the debate about what, what should or shouldn't be in it. That model of general education or liberal education barely exists anywhere else. And some of us are trying, who believe in that model are trying to do something to re revive it. And Roosevelt's book and Roosevelt's uh, uh, speaking, uh, I think has been a great help for this. So it, with that context in mind, a couple of questions that came in through the Q and A are very pertinent. One from Jonathan Friedman who makes the point, well, something like the core is very expensive. So how could we imagine other institutions moving even slightly in, in such a direction. Howard, Howard Levy uh, uh, raises the point, echoing what Roosevelt said or challenging Roosevelt to explain how what he said is consistent with the idea of expanding this model. If in fact, this kind of general education is fundamentally at odds with the disciplinary specialized um, thrust of the research university, what possible hope could there be to um, have this kind of um, education proceed in other similar institutions. Um, Richard Stryer, distinguished professor from the University of Chicago, whom I first knew I don't know, 45 plus years ago when he was what we used to call a section man in a course on 17th century English poetry, um, put a question in the, in the, in the Q&A. Why should there be an opposition between general education and specialized education? Why can't we think of the one leading to the other so that students will develop the desire to really master uh, material uh, because they're ignited by the experience in general education? Good question. So I'd be interested in your responses to those questions. 
I'm going to say one last thing and shut up. Um, on the first one, on the cost point, it's it's very it's very true that a core type curriculum doesn't come cheap. But one of the things we've discovered, if you think about community colleges and large public universities where they have a retention problem, right? A student retention problem. At a place like Columbia, you can assume that almost all the students who come in the door will go out the other end four years later with a degree. That's far from true at most institutions. And it turns out that if in fact you have this kind of teaching at the, in the first year in a general education program that touches the lives of lots of students, that it helps them want to stay in college, gives them a reason to stay in college. And it therefore, in some degree, pays for itself. So that's just one observation I make about that first question. And then I would open it up to any or all of you to respond to any of the above. <clears throat> I've lots to say about um, each of these questions. And, and let me begin, um, and I hope that others can also chime in. But on this question of, of expense, um, you know, I think we can easily get deluded into into thinking that that education should be um, cost effective. Um, and um, is it is it a wonder that the highest quality of education is more expensive than um, a mediocre education? It should not it should not be surprising. Uh, education involves an investment. Education involves a um, postponement, a, a deferment um, of benefit in order to do something that is worthwhile in itself. So, so I know that that's a hard, a hard thing, you know, that doesn't necessarily get you any, any budget increases in the legislature when they pass their annual budget, but it's just important to keep that in mind that we should get past the idea that our point is to do it as cheaply as possible. I, I sometimes I think about cooking as an analogy, you know, the point is not to stuff the largest number of calories possible in the quickest time when you make a meal. That's 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 not what we are after when we try to uh, achieve quality uh, in cooking. The other thing about about expense, um, in some ways cuts against that, but sometimes at Columbia, I would hear that, especially when I was director, that kind of, the core is expensive. You know, it takes a lot of faculty, small classes. Why don't we raise the class sizes? Why don't we turn it into a lecture with discussion sections that maybe graduate students can teach? Um, and the core at Columbia is only expensive if you look at the budget for next year. Um, if you look at the budget for the last 20 years, if you if you take a long view, then the core just not only pays for itself, the, lower, the, the core is a cash cow for the university because of the loyalty that it creates in alumni, the transformation that so many alumni uh, associate with the core and their willingness to support that, that education. So now that is a peculiar to Columbia, not every, that doesn't kind of generalize to the sector, uh, but some aspects of it, of, of it, of it do. Uh, that the the this kind of transformative education is an investment, um, and that with the right institutional structures is is an investment that pays off even in the budget uh, lines of of the university. Um, a word on the on the dominance of of dis the, the disciplines, I, and and you know why hope is there for general education? I think there's quite a quite quite a bit, and in fact. As we all know, the liberal arts disciplines are experiencing a dramatic and alarming shrinkage. Um, and it seems to me that the future of the disciplines is in general education. The future of the disciplines is to reorient the faculty towards teaching undergraduates who are not going to major, or at least are not planning to major in the liberal arts, but who are still alive and, and susceptible to the power of encountering in a rigorous, nourishing, intellectually rich environment, these texts, these questions, this humanistic cultivation. It turns out that many of those students who may not have been planning to study liberal education might get turned on and take other courses, maybe even major. But the disciplines, I think, just as a matter of survival, 
will need to reorient themselves away from the specialized questions and into general education. That means reorient towards pedagogy for their own, for their own survival. Um, and that, that, and that, that kind of links into Richard Stryer's question. I do think that they are, um, they can work like hand in glove, the, the, the specialized um, versus the general, the general education purposes. Um, someone, I heard someone compare say of literature humanities at Columbia, that it was the gateway drug to the humanities. And in, in, indeed, all of us who work at Columbia uh, know of students who get turned on to a certain kind of humanistic pursuit um, and go on to take more classes, sometimes even to major in the humanities because of their experience in literature humanities. We'd love to hear other people's thoughts on these questions. Thanks, Roosevelt. Indeed, if any of the other panelists want to respond either to those questions <coughs> or to something that Roosevelt said in his follow-up or rejoinder, this would be a good moment. We have sudden reticence. Um, okay, well then I will, uh, I'll pull a couple of other questions that came in from the uh, Q&A. This one I'm, I fear might be a bit of a showstopper. Um, <coughs> from, from Tim Vanable, what would your advice be to someone who aspires to become a professor in the liberal arts? Um, can you hear me? David, go ahead. Um, I have some uh, information. Um, it's, it's sort of irrelevant to the high flown nature of this conversation, but my friend, Jonathan Cole, who's a sociologist, a former uh, uh, head of the sort of academic side of Columbia, uh, years ago has told me on numerous occasions that there's sufficient data out there uh, to show that those students who get PhDs at a research university uh, and are, I mean, or, or are now in, uh, in many cases in despair because they don't, there don't seem to be any many jobs at the end of the five, seven, nine, ten years of, of labor. Um, there's sufficient data out there to show that um, in, in fact, um, those people who work in corporation, industry, nonprofits, government have roughly the same level of uh, satisfaction that professors have. Now, I mean, this is this does not. Um, it's it's something I wish the graduate students who were striking recently at Columbia knew because I had the feeling. Um, that, uh, I mean, there were explicit demands, of course, for payment and uh, dental coverage and so on and so forth, but that there were underneath that was a kind of uh, deep uh, unhappiness um, and, un, you know, at the thought that there might not be a job at the end of this. Now, I mean, this is not relevant to our, quite relevant to our conversation, but uh, I think it's worth knowing uh, and it's, it's worth uh, hearing that this that uh, a PhD at a research university does in fact um, outfit you for many kinds of life. Well, <laughs> far be it from me, of course, to speak um, ill of a former provost. And I uh, uh, respect uh, Jonathan's uh, impulse there, but um, I, I think most young people who undertake graduate study uh, at least in the kind of fields represented here, do so because they want to become professors. And um, the questioner was asking, is that still a plausible ambition, aspiration? I, it's sort of unfair to ask any of you to respond to that, but you know, we can all understand where that question is coming from. And it speaks to Roosevelt's point, which I think should be obvious to us all. The liberal arts and humanities in particular are um, in free fall at most institutions. And one point um, that I think is worth noting, as Roosevelt stressed, is that those institutions that have a vibrant and vital general education curriculum of the sort that even resembles slightly what we're describing here tonight, um, they do better in that respect. 
and humanities faculty uh, have a stronger claim to uh, staying in the faculty and replicating themselves with future faculty if there are, are in fact undergraduate students who want to study uh, in such fields because they've had a, a mind opening experience in general education. So that would be just a general response to a couple of the observations that have been made, but it's, I'm not supposed to be talking so much. So somebody else want to say something about any of this? Yeah, I'll jump in very quickly. I, I want to honor the folks who went on strike uh, and who organized um, for a redistribution of resources. Um, because I see they're striking as actually committed um, to evaluating and uh, ideally um, pushing ahead on what in the longer run will be the only meaningful way, in my view, of answering Tim's question ethically. Um, the answer, as I see it, uh, is to build towards a, a university and a system for the production of knowledge that redistributes material resources such that there are actually jobs. Um, but this means attending to the conditions of the present, which is what uh, the folks striking or intent um, uh, on doing something about. Um, it's all fine to, to say to folks on, on the basis of, of the material um, uh, harnessed and, and harvested by, by Cole and others, you know, in the long term, uh, your satisfaction with this PhD um, is uh, likely to be on a level with the satisfaction that folks in other, um, with other uh, professionalizing um, uh, trajectories have. Uh, but People are broke now <laughs> and their brokenness um, materially impinges on the conditions um, of knowledge production at Columbia and at other institutions, right? So I think another side of, 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 of the story that, uh, uh, that is so central to Roosevelt's book and that is, is, is worth underlining here um, is that when we think about what makes liberal education possible and attainable, both as a practice in the classroom and as a desirable career objective for those of us who you know, end up in this business or who might wanna end up in this business, security is paramount. You need to actually earn a living wage. Um, and without a reorganization of society such that living wages for folks involved in humanistic knowledge production become a fixture and a staple um, of, of our community and our nation, I, I don't see there being a hopeful answer to, to Tim's question. On that note, which I think is sort of at least an implied call to arms, um, I think um, it falls to me to thank you all. And, and I'll just push my analogy with a, with a good core class a little bit, not even implied indeed, um, a, a little bit further and say that this discussion strikes me as akin to the best kind of class, which is to say um, it's ending too soon and everybody would like to come back for another session. But we have to call it a night. Um, thank you all very, very much. Thank you out there for joining us and um, uh, have a great evening and stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.